which are clearly marked one there, door there, uh, that's a stream, so don't use that one. Mobile phones, please ensure your mobile phone and any other devices are switched off or on silent. This is especially important for meetings of crazy judicial and judicial, but we are not, so that can go. Recording the meeting is being filmed for live or subsequent broadcast, except where there are confidential or exempt items, and that does apply to the last item tonight. By entering the council chamber and using public seating areas, you're consenting to being filmed. I can't see the crowd. Did we have, did we have crowd control tonight? It might have done. Uh, if this presents a difficulty, please inform democratic services. Um, additional points, you must speak as close as possible to the microphone and speak loudly and clearly, uh, that's what it says. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand, that's a normal procedure, and referring, which is more important, to a specific report, page or slide, please do so that everybody can follow it. And finally, would councillors remember to collect their post from the members' lounge? Um, and the other thing we have to remember is that if we want to go past 10 o'clock, we've got to extend the meeting. <clears throat> Can I uh, welcome Alex from our new auditors, Bishop Fleming, who um, have put a schedule in that suggests we might get everything signed off earlier than we have done in the past. I look forward, even if not present, to learning that to be the case. Welcome, anyway. Thank you for coming. Um, we have... I think apologies somewhere. We've got a couple of apologies. Right. Declarations of interest. Um, minutes of the last meeting. Yes, Martin. Councillor Brown. Yes, this maybe this may be my error. Um, on page eleven. It says, in response to Councillor Shoemaker, I don't think he's on this committee, I don't remember him being here. Possibly he'd put in a written question, I don't know. Or is that a mistake? Near the second, par second paragraph of page 11. Right. The minutes bits are right. We've only got as far as the minutes. Do you have any comment on the minutes? You weren't anyway. All right, no comment then. So the minutes you're all quite happy, those who were one, two, three, four, five. Yep. Okay. No public questions. No. So the next item for discussion is the Information Government's Framework, um, which is Agenda Item 6. Owen, ah, welcome, Owen Chandler. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. The floor is yours, and so is the report at the moment, yes. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, keeping it brief, uh, this is essentially a major review of the documentation that we hold related chiefly to data protection, government transparency and access to information, uh, mainly freedom of information. Uh, we use the opportunity to review it and modernise it in the vague hope of making life a little bit easier for uh, our officers as it can be quite complex and sometimes frustratingly subjective these these areas so uh i appreciate the report is a bit of a whopper so i do apologize um but ultimately it's there to modernize consolidate 
bring things up uh, in line with all the various changes to the uh, to the legislation. Um, as noted in the report, there is some major legislation in the pipeline in the Lords, but there's no real uh, clue as to when that might pass. So this is this is what we've got for now, and I think it should last us at least another four years with minor revisions when the legislation changes. Any questions? I, this is obviously necessary and excellent, and thank you for that. I guess my question is, how do we make sure that staff understand it's there to help them and understand it's there for them to adhere to? What training are we planning? Thank you. Um, so with regards to training, we've got a few different uh, training mechanisms for these, these topics. Uh, we've got e-learning as a mandatory training, as a refresher for all officers and members. But also, um, as part of my role, uh, I essentially do outreach to all services and offer tailored training for officers, regardless of their speciality. Um, once approved, we put this up on our intranet, as well as the website. Uh, I'll be briefing the leadership and management team on the changes and using that as well as a bit of an opportunity to ask them to contact me and reach out if they've got any concerns about it. Um, but we do also do quite a bit of proactive monitoring um, on compliance across all these areas as well. Thank you, Aaron. It's a very uh, comprehensive policy and um, I think it looks very good. You know, obviously done a thorough job on uh, catching up with legislation, a very complex area of, of sort of regulation and legislation, isn't it? Um, my comment is really when it's on uh, on your introduction, you referred to the fact that there was uh, an average of six information um, uh, note compliance notices that have been you know, in terms of complaints that have gone to um, the information commission officer. On the back of those, was there any comment that's come back from the information officer? And if there was, was that reflected into the policy? Thank you. Uh, generally, when it comes to complaints to the ICO, uh, the six were. Essentially, we welcome it, to be perfectly honest, because it can be quite a subjective area. Um, we will do everything we can to uh, review case law, review the regulations. Um, to be honest, the topics were quite broad. It's usually around um, a, a disagreement on whether we would disclose something based on an exemption. So, for example, we might have said we're not going to disclose something because it, we felt it was uh, personal information that there was no public interest in. Um, we follow the internal review process, which is essentially our internal complaints process. And then if the data, uh, if the requester still disagrees, they can go to the ICO. And it's at that point we essentially put forward our case again. Um, and if they come back and ask us to uh, change a decision, we are happy to comply with it. Um, frankly, it's quite a useful legislative mechanism to rely on them sometimes when we've done everything we can. Um, but ultimately, there's there's still a disagreement. So we we learn from it. Is is kind of the ultimate. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hurst. Please. That's better. Thank you. Um, just for my personal information, really, are other levels of local governance also needing to um, recognise this and accord with it? Uh, I'm, I'm personally a parish councillor as well, and um, I think the, the level of mm, governance control, call it what you like, that is driven by this, to my mind, doesn't appear at, my, at the parish council level. Having said that, if there's a complaint against the parish council, we tend to refer it back up to the monitoring officer anyway. So can you advise me, please, um, sh should, should parish councils be aware of this? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, but to facilitate that, um, I will con our policy and governance team have done some excellent work on developing a sort of town and parish councils hub. Um, and as part of that, we have been rolling out optional training to uh, councillors and clerks at town and parish level. Um, we actually had the first one last year, which was received quite well, which included 
um, data protection training and specifically training that can assist with freedom of information um, because it can be quite a quite a tough thing to manage really um, so we will continue that as far as I'm aware I believe that that training will continue into next year and provided we get good feedback we'll keep give, uh, making it available to towns and parishes this document will be public um, so by all means anybody who wants to access it can use it as a as a guide and a basis um, so keen to not overstep <laughs> uh, boundaries when it comes to uh, independence of town and parish councils but um, ultimately yes everybody should be aware of it who has local authority um, powers really well I've got a couple for you um, and the first bit that concerns me is councillors must advise officers of the capacity in which they seek data, e.g. private citizen, district councillor in a support capacity for a constituent. Surely any situation makes the councillor still a councillor regardless. He can't suddenly become something different. He, can't, he, he is a, is a councillor de facto, so what's the point of the distinction? It's a good question, um, and th there's sort of two parts to it. So the first is, is frankly, that it's, it's a courtesy to officers. Um, you know, there, there is a power dynamic, and officers find it useful to know why somebody is asking for information, whether it be a fellow officer, a councillor, you know, a member of the public. Context is, is key, really. Um, if if councillors can get into the habit of... of when they're asking for information, just being clear on, on why and the context, it's really appreciated that officers can then make the key decisions. Um, secondly, though, there is there is some case law that, that sort of backs this up. Um, you'll have to forgive me, I may have prepared for this. <laughs> <laughs> so with regards to more of the legislative side, councillors, I, I believe it's under the, I mean, monitor and officer will know more, but one of the local government acts, I think it's, 72 says any business to be transacted at a meeting of the council committee or subcommittee shall be open to inspection by any member of the council uh, regardless of, um, unless there's a confidentiality exception which is what how most of you get your information but there are also sort of more common law principles that data should only be accessible where is re where it is reasonably necessary to enable the member to properly perform their duties as councillor. And the specific, uh, I think there were about three or four cases, they were all in like the 80s, so they're getting on a bit, but they still apply. Um, that basically said, if the councillor's motive for seeing documents is indirect, improper or ulterior, it may be raised as a bar to their entitlement. So we just kind of want to keep the transparency open and the accountability open so that if you are asking for things, it's, it's just clear why. Um, and ultimately, they said that if a, if a member is not a member of a committee or subcommittee, the councillor should show good cause why they require sight um, of, of data and why it's necessary to perform their duties. So it's, you know, we're not forcing anybody to do anything, but it is that sort of, it, it's a nice thing to do. It helps officers, it helps the council with transparency and accountability. <coughs> And there is some case law to back up that, unfortunately, some people have been, you know, trying to fish for information they had no no need to really. That that's why why we've put it in there. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure the law has got a good understanding of their reasoning. Yours truly is still somewhat mystified. I don't see how I can't be a counsellor when I ask a question. It's just that simple. But there you go. Um, the other question I've got for you, which just struck me as defies logic. Potential monetary fines to the tune of 17 and a half million. How many times do you think this council could make a mistake before it actually goes, goes for a 114? I mean, isn't there a touch of overkill attached to this? So the 17 and a half million is um, the ICO's rule. Uh, however, as noted on the report, in June 22, they did admit that is probably not really um, relevant to local authorities because ultimately it's public money that would simply be um, rude. Um, but they absolutely will use their enforcement powers and they'll provide notices, they'll request us to do certain things 
um, which obviously we you know we want to avoid if we if we can for reputational yeah. reasons though. Oh, I absolutely understand. Um, it just struck me as well, slightly overstating the case, to be perfectly frank. Um, and the other thing I think that hasn't been pulled out of here is on page 37, according to my paperwork, uh, about halfway down, under the right to be informed. Individuals do not have the right to be informed if their information is being processed for a purpose exempt from GDPR. That's correct. Would you like me to give you an example? Yes, an example would be useful for people listening in. Yeah, never mind me. <laughs> the, most, the most common one is law enforcement purposes or where disclosure could prejudice an investigation. Um, so, for example, counter fraud. Mm -hmm. um, if, if somebody puts in a subject access request uh, wanting to know if, you know, they want to see all information we have on them, for example, just keeping it general. If there's an active investigation on them, they prob that's probably their motive, even though we, we don't really mind what their motive is. Uh, but naturally, disclosure of that information, if it is likely to prejudice an ongoing investigation that is outside of the GDPR, it's exempted under the Data Protection Act. Thank you, Owen, for that. And one final question, although I'm sure you can't give me an answer to it. After all this process you go through with the um, request coming in, what's the additional cost? In terms of labour or...? In terms of, in terms of everything. Somewhere in this was 50 officers being briefed to, to deal with this. Yeah. It surely doesn't come at nil cost. Nope, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's definitely a significant labour cost to it. However, it is part and parcel of being any local uh, public authority, really. Um, I think Stroud actually manages the resource and how we actually manage, for example, freedom of information and, and subject access requests um, pretty well. Um, services have autonomy to decide, you know, who will lead on these things. And we really try and encourage a collaborative way of of resolving them so it's not just it shouldn't be put on the shoulders of one person everybody should kind of help do their small part um but yes there is definitely a cost to it yeah anybody else with any further questions right uh, back to the beginning of this and we are Then I need to propose that the committee is asked to resolve to approve the revised information government's framework and delegate responsibility to the data protection officer to make minor changes to the information government's framework. And I propose it, please. Councillor Davis and seconded Martin Piercy. Thank you. All in favour? You can debate if you wish to. I didn't ask you to debate. I thought you had to go already. Have a debate if you'd like one, Nick. Carry on. I'm quite here. I mean, I've just spent the morning going through this for a second time, and I have to say that it's a weighty piece of kit. So if you wish to give us a summary of what you think, I'd be delighted to hear it. No, Nigel, I wasn't being perverse. I was just merely following protocol. Right, fair enough. There is no debate then on that. My apologies. My slip up. All right. Um, all right, agenda item seven, safeguarding audit management. Audit update from Stephen Miles, please. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening, uh, councillors. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, the report you've got in front of you in, in relation to this agenda item um, is the management update from the safeguarding audit. Um, and you'll be aware of that being done uh, towards the end of last year, as in 2023. Um, we've done some consultation and feedback, so very much a case of um, the... Council's Corporate Safeguarding Group have uh, collectively considered all the content of the uh, of the audit report. Um, 
in particular at the, the most recent meeting, 28th of March. Um, we were forming um, the new safeguarding policy and procedures guide um, when, when the audit was being undertaken. So it was kind of carried out inclusive of, of, of that piece of work as well. So um, there are a couple of background papers that hopefully you've uh, accessed the links on um, in the report. Um, obviously, the, back, the, the background paper A is the audit risk assurance report, which you're, um, you'll be familiar with, the main document. And then uh, in support of that, what I've just referred to, uh, the new safeguarding policy procedures guide. That uh, new uh, document, that new guide um, was approved resolved by Community Services and Licensing Committee uh, in uh, March. Um, so, so that will now form the basis of, of obviously our, our policy and practices around safeguarding. Um, in terms of the introduction and the background to the report of, of you've got in front of you, uh, there's three points really to, to highlight. Um, I've already made reference to uh, the report coming forward to us in December. Um, the findings of this uh, work resulted in 14 recommendations, prioritised as follows, two that were high priority, 10 that were medium priority, and two that were low priority. These are obviously featured in the in background paper A. Um, in, in terms of the second point there, relating to the recommendations, is a management action plan, uh, and you will have seen that as well, I'm sure, uh, which includes comments from the respective service managers, uh, and, and the agreed actions uh, the, uh, and, and the respective dates. So this is really a report to just give you an update on, on our progress on that. Um, we did note that the um, audit rating was acceptable for, for the audit. So uh, from that basis, um, there's a couple of things I want to just highlight. I'm more than happy to take questions throughout all, the, all those main points that I've done. Um, particularly because they were high priority. Recommendation one, um, what you've got in front of you under section two, 2.1, um, to highlight recommendation one, the risk management process has been created in the form of a risk register uh, and is now being populated by respective uh, service managers following the approval of that uh, new policy and procedures guide. So that's a piece of work that is clearly uh, and obviously ongoing. Um, and on 2.2, the other high priority, um, in unison with developing the, uh, the policy and procedures guide, a range of measures have been in introduced in regards to you know, the management of safeguarding training for staff and elected members. Essentially, these focus on determining whether a staff member uh, should complete safeguarding level three in addition to levels one and two uh, that are mandatory. So there's four, uh, there's three points there, A, B and C, um, that highlights some of the actions uh, that we have done so far and are uh, continually to do. Um, some of that in relation to item C there, um, the requir requirements for disclosure bar in service checks and respective management are being combined with the system of um, training uh, and monitoring and th those training uh, training that takes place. There is a training review that is under underway, um, and we're going to be looking at the online training modules uh, as part of our e-learning, which which focus on levels one and two, but also take into consideration what our needs are in relation to safeguarding training at level three um, and some bespoke training. So we did talk um, at the CSNL committee in relation to the, the policy and procedures guide in, in, in a greater detail and context around that, uh, but obviously highlighting it now uh, on, on those points. Um, Chair, I mean, I, I'm happy to take questions on it, you know, any of the report really. Uh, so uh, I'll pause there on terms of those points. Um, that are all listed under the medium priority and low priority, and just sort of fast track to the conclusion under item three, um, highlighting that the re recommendations in the management action plan have either been completed or are progressing towards completion. Uh, main points 
above highlight the work that's been carried out. Uh, the corporate safeguarding group um, acknowledges that there is more work to do in addressing all these recommendations and will continue to oversee the, that important pieces of work. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions? questions? Councillor Baker. Sorry, Steve, I'm probably being very dense. I have read the safeguarding policy and procedures, but I didn't see the back, that I should have read the background papers. My question is about the first recommendation, and it says a risk management process has been created in the form of a risk register. What risks are you looking at? I mean, is that all to do with training, or is it to do with how people are addressing um, safeguarding issues? I just didn't know what the register was referring to. Okay. I mean, it, it, re it relates to a number of things, actually. Um, safeguarding is everybody's responsibility in the council. Um, different levels of responsibility that we've highlighted in the policy procedures guide in terms of officers uh, and, and obviously uh, elected members as well. So what we've got there is it's in relation to each service so there are a number of um obviously in for example community and customer facing services that will be that, that do interact with um people so it's acknowledging that those risks um if the services do not um uphold the policies um and the duties that, w that we do uh, and putting things in place just to make sure that we, we we follow the right procedures so that's what the the register is there for um hopefully we've um we, we can present to you perhaps at a later date in a bit more detail once the the whole risk register is complete uh, i mean it's work in progress like i said so uh you know it'd be remiss of me to to present the whole the, the whole thing to you at this stage is, is that okay yes yeah, so largely speaking it's risk to the public people that we communicate with yes and yeah. we'll risk to everybody but i mean yeah. I, th I think you know there you've got to acknowledge that you know say there's safeguarding of the the people we work with yeah um in terms of customers and um communities but also internally as well I so, so there's there's a holistic element to all safeguarding uh, and hopefully that comes through within the, the policy and procedures guide and, and that can be re reflected then on our on our risk res register as i understand it the reason it was put as a high priority um was that we didn't have one in that sense in relation to safeguarding but we do now and we're now working on its content if you like fabulous thank you very much right. no problem councillor brown thank you steve um this is not exactly about the report, but how, how often, if at all, do we have safeguarding issues or uh, challenges, whatever you might call them, arising in the council's work? Um, our, our responsibilities sort of go beyond highlighting concerns or incidents um, in relation to the services that we deliver and the people that we interact with. Um, we've got statutory duties to cooperate uh, with in, in respect of legislation and our on statutory guidance. So in relation to children's safeguarding, Gloucestershire Safeguarding Children's Partnership, we're an active partner of that, um, uh, that partnership and Gloucestershire Safeguarding Adults Board. We, we're also obviously part of that board. Um, stemming from that there, I would say we have a regular communication with um different agencies doing different pieces of work in relation to safeguarding so there'll be you know there's other um organizations particularly of a, of a, of a county-wide nature that will have more responsibilities than us particularly around children's social care and adult social care for example um so we uh, we, uh, we have a, a statutory duty to to interact with them and communicate which we do so you know like i said just now um it's a weekly on a weekly basis in relation to safeguarding concerns or incidents and there is a slight differentiation between that um again uh that can be weekly i, I couldn't really sort of highlight a, a particular pattern as as we speak but it, it's something that we have to work on uh and and be and be ready to respond to um and be part of um 
cases that are being not necessarily managed by our officers in that safeguarding sense, but be part of a multi-agency approach, whether that's in relation to children or relation to adults. Um, you know, we 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 are um, called upon to be to be present. You know, on that work, uh, and in which case we do. Okay. As a Davis brief. Um, thank you, Steve. And, and I confess I read this and I am confused. It, it comes across as a sort of analog point in time update on the risks, which should be something, and I think you just said we do have a risk register, which is presumably online and in real time. And so I was, when I read this, I sort of, well, it's interesting, but it's probably already out of date by the time we got to see it. And things have moved on. Am I right in understanding that actually the real value is in the risk register that we're creating? Yes, I mean, in terms of what we're, we're creating, I mean, I, I think I hopefully made reference to it, is that it, it, it's work in progress. I mean, we've, you know, we've created it since the, say, uh, the policy and procedures guide was, was, was approved. Um, so, so, that, so that was middle of March. Um, so there's there's work ongoing with that. So it, it, it is live and it is up, being updated when when we get that information coming in from different services. Um, so so what you I suppose what I think what you said is that we are at a point in time at the moment. Um, once that's complete, we 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 will you know we we can, we're happily to you know to share that with you as elected members. I'm sure, and and, and do a provide another update uh, to, to yourselves. Councillor Hurst. Thank you. Um, I'll do the elephant in the room stuff, shall I? Um, this this report, thank you, Steve, um, and indeed quite a lot of the matters on the agenda this evening come to me as a, a sign of bureaucratic overindulgence, for want of a better word. I know, I know that we are required by law to be aware of this. And I'm sure that all of this is driven by national legislation. Can you define for me, please, the requirement for how that needs to be updated, maybe as part of good governance, maybe as part of legislative uh, necessity? Because all of this replaces stuff which is already on the table. And that has obviously worked up to this point. What has changed to require this to be revisited? Thank you. Um, in, in relation to the um, audit risk assurance report uh, that was carried out, and I understand that that, was, that would have been called for by yourselves as a committee. Um, so what we've got in front of us is, is a response to those recommendations that were detailed in the report. Um, in relation to what's changed, um, as, I understand, as I understand it, the, the recommendations flagged up a number of areas that we needed to improve on. Um, so we've either done that or we're working towards making sure that's complete. If your question is in relation to safeguarding uh, in a broader context, um, we have to review our policy it is in the policy to review the policy and procedures uh, annually um, so we started that piece of work um, er earlier on in 2023 uh, and we did a pretty much root and branch check on that and it's in relation to um, our legal duties but also statutory guidance so we had to take into consideration the things that do change so there are quite a few things that do change uh, in relation to safeguarding, um, in particular, um, as we were doing this doing this piece of work, uh, the statutory guidance in relation to children's safeguarding, titled "Working Together to Safeguard Children 2023," um, was uh, was released by by government. So that was in December. Um, so there there will, there will be a reaction to that, and there will be responsibilities by Gloucestershire Safeguarding Children's Partnership to respond to that, and th they are responding to that because they're including partners in that in in that work, and we're one of those partners. So I, I kind of hoping that that's covered your your question. 
Yes, yes, it does to some degree. Thank you. I mean, obviously, all of these reports cost a lot of time, officer time, and money to prepare and deliver. And then there is the cost of actually delivering on, on what the reports have um, highlighted as being the concerns. So I'm actually standing down from council this May, and part of that reason is that I think the whole process is in danger of becoming over bureaucratic. So for me, this is, as I say, I'm not in any way having a go or anything like that. For me, this is about the, the, the trend uh, of the whole governance of the country not just local authorities. And I think we're going over the top on an awful lot of stuff, and it's going to cost us dear. But as I say, that, this, this area, that's kind of more debate than, uh, than question, so I do apologize, Chairman. As to Piercy, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your, for your update uh, and report. I've just got a, um, a, just a couple of clarification po points, if I may, on the uh, recommendation 6, which I think is 2.6. So um, the spot checks for DBS certification, um, I'm assuming that's in addition to some uh, confirmation that we get from the contractors or a commitment from the contractors that all their contractors are, are DBS cleared. And then the second one is just to confirm whether those checks, so spot checks, are done just in response to the audit or whether that's a program of ongoing spot checks throughout the year that um, continue anyway. So that was just a couple of points. Thank you. No, thank, thank you for the question there. Um, um, it, as I mentioned at the start of uh, my presentation, the uh, audit work uh, was carried out and the report was produced whilst we were uh, undertaking a review and change of our policy and procedures. So we, we highlighted this particular area in that some of that work. So it was actually quite timely. Um, what come first, chicken and egg? To be quite honest, I can't remember wh uh, whether whether we were we'd already highlighted this ahead of the report, uh, the audit report being produced. But we were covering a lot of things in relation to our policy and procedures that needed to change all at the same time. So it was a it was it was quite a mixture of a lot of pieces of work. Um, Hopefully, what we've done in terms of the guide document is brought a lot of things together and brought brought things absolutely bang up to date where they should be. Um, so, this particular piece of work in relation to doing spot checks uh, on DBS certification is ongoing um, and should be carried out, uh, you know, on, on that regular basis. Um, I, I don't know, as I has been highlighted in the report, exactly the time scale. Um, and we're exploring that. The, the work around DBS uh, checks and certification is going to is part of that uh, review that I mentioned in in, in unison with uh, our training program. Um, so again, the detail uh, of exact timelines on things like this will will hopefully come through once that review has been done. So it's a more of a practical a practical element, if you like, um, in, in terms of the detail. But we understand that it is. It is that these do date place, yes. Okay, if I've got a kind of a follow on question, I'm only just thinking from my industry where uh, if you've got a contractor on one of our sites and they haven't got the right accreditation, particularly from health and safety, then they're off our site within five minutes. So, what if we do these spot checks and they're not cleared? What happens to those contractors? Um, I think. To, to be fair, um, what we've highlighted on this one is that we're we're waiting for an update from from the officer in terms of uh, in terms of that progress on what what does happen. So specifically in relation to housing contractors, I can't answer that question right here and now. If I'm really really honest, um, it may be that tomorrow that can be happen, and I'm not saying it will be tomorrow. You know, I'm just being really honest with you. Um, but hopefully that will that can be resolved fairly quickly. Um, in terms of communication from, from that said officer. Okay, thank you. Could I request that we get an update, you know, informally outside the committee just to see where we are on that? Would that be? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Remind me, Steve, I'm sure you've got a target date. So it says under conclusion. It's either being completed or it's going to be completed. So do you have a rough target date for it? Is that in relation to the point that we were just discussing? Mm -hmm. 
off the top of my head, I don't know exactly what that date is, but I mean, we're, we're, we're talking probably weeks, not months for sure. All right, thank you. In view of the reminder I was already given, I will open this to debate now if you wish to have a discussion on the topic. We are only required to note this, but Paula, you'd like to speak, please. I would. Um, and I would like to speak in support of this, actually. And um, what may seem bureaucratic, I don't think is in regard to safeguarding, because obviously as a housing officer, I see an awful lot of things which worry me and it's it's massively important that we all understand what to do in those situations um, there is an increase in local authority responsibility in terms of um, DHRs and there's new, new serious um, reviews aren't there Steve which ones are those that have come in recently that is being funded by the police and crime commissioner that we participate in sorry say again the, the recent reviews that we're participating in that relate to serious incidents, I can't remember which what they were concerning, but you raised them at our last safeguarding briefing at CSNL. Um, yeah, I mean there are there are reviews that are taken, but it depends on which which one we're referring so, to. I know DHRs have been in place for a long time. Yes, and if we have seen something that we haven't dealt with properly then that would obviously come up in a review and that that is a reputational risk and it's also a risk to the individual that was at risk in the first place if we hadn't taken it forward so i think that this is very very important and i appreciate your point on bureaucracy and i think in a lot of cases i would agree with you but not with regard to safeguarding thank you paula Catherine Day. I, I think I might be the only person in Gloucestershire who's legally responsible for safeguarding children. I think, I think actually, if anything happened, as a cabinet member for children's services, and, and I agree, this is absolutely something uh, we need to do and we're obliged to do. I think Nick's point was slightly different, though, which is that we mustn't make this a cumbersome, a cumbersome overhead. And that was my concern, that this looks like an analogue point in time which is almost useless, bearing in mind how long the papers are produced before the meeting, rather than where we need to be, which is something that we can access online and is in real time. I think the, making this smooth and efficient is the objective, rather than not doing it. But um, that would be my only comment. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hurst, please. Yes. For the, for the record, I have no problem at all with safeguarding. It's absolutely essential. I understand that. Um, <coughs> Um, as, a, as a local authority or as a public body, we clearly have responsibilities which have to be managed and, and, rep and recognised. But the more and more paperwork that you put in place, the less and less people are likely to read it or understand it, or, or it, it, becomes, it becomes so burdensome. The, uh, the, the, the most efficient document is on one side of A4, hopefully, and people can then read it, understand it, absorb it, and behave by it, not 300 pages of stuff which is going to block up the holes in the skirting boards. Your modern interpretation, brevity of the soul of wit and of local government, is that correct? Yeah. Well, we're asked to just note the report, not that that diminishes it in any way, Steve. Thank you very much for your time. I think you've um, had some useful comments directed on this. And I take it the committee is not going to object to noting this report. No, I didn't think there would be anyway. All right. Thank you. Right, the next item, let me get the paper open, is to welcome and introduce Alex Walling. You're quite happy with being dressed as Alex. Thank you. Who's from Bishop Fleming to re present the report that they've, uh, the papers of which you should have been able to read before the meeting. Please carry on. Thank you, Chair. Um, I thought just before I launch into the, the audit plan, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about Bishop Fleming and also about myself. Um, obviously, your predecessor auditor was Deloitte. Um, Bishop Fleming is quite a new firm to local government audit. Um, this is the 23-24 will be the first year that we would have done local government audits. And we were one of the firms that was uh, encouraged 
to actually tender for local government work um, because as you're probably aware there's quite a dearth of public sector auditors out there the, the big boys have got a lot of a lot of the work but there is still a dearth out of, of auditors out there um, so we actually um, tended for the work back in 22 and actually won um, a significant um, proportion of the work down in the southwest. We all, we do the smaller audits, so as a firm we don't actually do any external audits that are actually fall into the FRC um, domain, and that's by choice. It's a, it's a risk appetite. Um, thought so the audits that we've picked up in the southwest are predominantly people like yourself district councils the smaller police authorities gloss police wiltshire police etc um, and also fire and one national park as well and I, we've actually just picked up a couple of audits in the northwest as well um, again smaller ones so that that's the the firm a bit of background to the firm so if i was in your shoes i if i'm honest i'd probably be sat there thinking well what on earth do they know about local government audit and you you know let's be honest local government accounts are quite complicated i think it's probably fair to say so what bishop fleming then did is they've recruited um people at the senior level who've got ex extensive experience in local government audit um and Mark, who would be with me today, who's your manager, and myself, both have quite, got quite a lot of extent, um, audit experience. In fact, we both started life with the Audit Commission. Um, so I started as a trainee many, many, many years ago in Birmingham as a, an Audit Commission sit for trainee. And then moved to, down to Bristol. And I've continued with the Audit Commission until it was abolished. Then I tube it across to Grant Thornton. And I actually left Grant Thornton back in October last year and then have since joined Bishop Fleming. So as I say, between Mark and I, I keep doing this because that's where Mark would probably be sat if he was here. Mark's based down in Plymouth, so it didn't make an awful lot of sense for him to, to come up Quite. to this meeting. I thought I would cover it. Um, so we do, between us, have got quite a lot of extensive experience. Um, and obviously we're growing the team. We're imparting our information to them and uh, how local government actually works, etc. So hopefully you'll feel a bit more reassured that actually, hopefully Bishop Fleming actually knows what it's doing. Um, the document that you've got in front of you is our external audit plan. It covers the year 23-24. Um, the auditing standards pretty much set out what we as external auditors have to put in our audit plans. So there are certain things that we have to tell you. We have to tell you what work we're doing, the time scale, the fee, that we're independent, we're abiding by the ethical standards, etc. So our audit plan is probably not that dissimilar to ones that you will have seen before from your predecessor auditor. Now, I'm aware that your predecessor auditor, Deloitte, came to the last audit committee and gave you an update on where they were on their work and that there's um, some of the work that's outstanding from 22 23, namely the opinion on the accounts and the value for money work as well. When that, that work is actually completed, that will no doubt have some impact on the audit plan that you've got in front of you. I'm hoping it's not going to have a fundamental uh, impact, but it might do. It might, we might need to tweak some of the things around the edges, but obviously we'll make sure we discuss that with the finance team and also bring any changes back to yourself as well. So we've set out in the audit plan exactly what we'll be doing. Our work is pretty much governed by the NAO's code of practice. So we do, as I mentioned, we do we give an opinion on your financial statements and we look at your VFM, so your three E's, economy, efficiency and effectiveness, focusing on those key three areas that the NAO are interested in. So, and hopefully the general public are interested in financial sustainability. And I think it's fair to say every time you open a, a newspaper, a BBC website, you see lots of councils that are heading towards bankruptcy. I use that word loosely because it's not actually strictly true, but bankruptcy. So it's it's constantly in the press. Governance, and we've, we've talked a bit this morning or this, this evening already about governance, how the importance of governance and, and having process in place. And also the three E's, the economy, efficiency and effectiveness. This is public money we're talking about. So obviously... Joe Public wants to make sure that you're making the best use of it. And we look at the arrangements you have in place to actually deliver that value for money. So we're not actually saying you are value for money. We're just looking at those arrangements in totality. 
I've caveated the, the plan quite heavily in certain places because there are some national consultations are out. Um, they've actually finished, but we're waiting for the outcomes of those. So that's consultations from the National Audit Office, from DLUC, and also from SIPRA itself, who obviously put together the, the code under which the accounts are pulled together. Um, they're all in response to the fact that the, I think it was as of the 31st of December last year, there were 771 audit opinions unsigned across the country. There are some local authorities who haven't had their accounts finalised for two, three, four years for a variety of reasons, and I, I won't rehearse here what you know what my views are because it would be inappropriate. But I think it's a it's a perfect storm. Um, to, to be perfectly honest. So they're looking at ways to actually address that so that we can all move on. Because nobody wants to be auditing 19, 20 accounts. We all want to, it's not helpful for any of your stakeholders, for the public. How, how, we, how do entities make decisions around financial planning, setting council tax, et cetera, et cetera, if they haven't got a set of um, audited accounts. So those consultations, as I say, they have finished, but we're waiting for the outcome for, of those. They may have some repercussions on your plan as well. And obviously, as soon as we become aware of it, again, we'll talk to the finance team and obviously bring back to you um, our, well, what the outcomes were, but also how we think that's actually going to impact on the work we do. So at the moment, Chair, I know you mentioned earlier about finalising the audit at the moment, we're optimistic that we can actually hit the de national deadlines, but I think that's subject to you know, what might happen over the, the coming months, and I'm hoping perhaps by the end of this month we'll have some clarity around those consultations. So that. That's pretty much all I was going to say about the plan, but I appreciate, I'm sure you've got some questions on it, and I'm more than happy to take them. Thank you very much. Questions? Looking around. I have to say that the, the date was very interesting to me, given the history of the last couple of years for our um, audit and audit opinion. Our accounts teams hit the deadlines and then we sit around waiting for audit to decide what valuation they might put on a piece of car park that isn't going to affect anything at all, but it has to be done because that's what it says nationally and we don't get signed off, which I just think is... It echoes what Councillor Hurst was saying earlier, I think. But I'm obliged to you for your introduction. And I look forward to working to you, with you in the future. I don't think we've got any de further detailed questions, no? Committee quite happy. We welcome you and look forward to working with your future. Thank you very much for coming. And we are obliged, uh, ladies and gentlemen, lady and gentlemen, I beg your pardon, uh, to note, no, do more, no, no more than note, is there anybody who wishes to say anything in lieu of debate? And I have a proposer and seconder that we note this. I mean, honestly. All right, thank you, Martin. Uh, and Stephen, thank you. Okay. Right. Now, in view of the uh, silence that's followed that, I take it you are all happy in this item. Nick, you wanted to say something? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Nigel. On the question of protocol, as soon as we say, you know, there was no debate, um, the, the clerk can record that in the minutes and it is then preserved for posterity. Sorry, say again, I missed the last bit. It's preserved for posterity that we didn't actually debate. We didn't oh, debate it. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, it's just a question. No, I'm record. quite sure some um, history professor will be studying this in 2090 to see how district councils survived in a really treacherous financial state in the early years of the 22nd century or whatever. Uh, it's all right. Um, I'll leave it at that now. Now then, this gets a bit more meaty. As we turn to, to uh, counter-fraud and anti-corruption policy, and it's Emma Cathcart again. So the floor is yours, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, apologies. I've got three reports, but I'll try and whiz through them. Um, the first one is, um, as discussed at the January meeting, our 
uh, partnership counter fraud and anti corruption policy. So Stroud have joined the partnership from the 1st of April, um, and the counter fraud and anti corruption policy is one that has been adopted by each of the councils, um, again, just to provide continuity across all of the uh, partners that we deliver to. Hopefully, it's relatively straightforward in terms of it setting out what um, fraud, corruption, bribery is for information for people um, and the um, actions and activities that we undertake. Um, my big message is always that we try to prevent rather than detect because we want to stop the money going anywhere. It's much harder to get it back. So a lot of our activity is about prevention, training, awareness, um, checks, etc. Um, so yes, Hopefully, relatively straightforward policy. Happy to take any questions. That was relatively short and sweet, actually, Emma. Questions? Comments? Councillor Hurst. Can I ask, please, um, how many times in the last five years has this policy been needed? Um, I'm trying to gauge the scope of the problem, basically. Well, the scope of fraud is that it's the most prevalent crime in the UK. So in terms of fraud being a problem, it is a problem. Um, it's in every activity. Um, we're all at risk of it all of the time. Um, we all have the potential to be doorstepped by a rogue trader or emailed from a hijacked account, have our money taken, etc. Within the council, we are undertaking investigations all the time, which is what I report to you. So um, investigations regarding fraud in the council tax support scheme, um, housing and tenancy fraud. So we rely on it heavily. Um, we would use it for any of our enforcement activity. So we could be looking at unlicensed breeders and we would have fraud act offences attached to their advertising, for example. So I rely on it heavily. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, I, I was going to ask this question in relation to one of the, your subsequent reports, but it follows up on Councillor Hurst a bit. What, what are the main areas for this council of fraud that you encounter that there's evidence of in terms either of number of cases or, or total money involved? So I think the easy answer to that is the usual benefits um, schemes, grant schemes are now becoming much more of a, an issue because we administer so many more grants um, and people are applying for money and we've got to make sure we're doing the right assurance and verification checks. Um, housing and tenancy fraud is really lucrative. If you're paying a very low social rent and you sublet your property for a commercial rent, then you're going to make money out of it. Um, there are air, it, procurement fraud, we, our budgets are high in some particular areas, so it could be that serious and organised crime gangs target particular activities. Um, it, it depends what we look for, but the usuals are housing and tenancy, benefits, grant schemes, um, council tax discounts. I'm, you know, claiming a single person discount, but actually there's several of us in the household, um, th things like that. So mostly attached to quick wins i think you know how can i get some some easy easy pickings and and among those that you just mentioned none particularly stand out as our biggest problem they're all mm -hmm. it, no it, you're, it's exactly we the same activity the number of referrals etc is really consistent across all of our partner councils across the county um which I think is evident in how you will work in similar ways for this, the schemes that we're looking at. There's a lot of county-wide schemes, a lot of county-wide cooperation. The um, Section 151 officers meet to discuss um, county-wide schemes, etc. So it's the same. You clearly have much higher risk because you still own a housing stock. So that's a, a much bigger risk, like with, with Cheltenham. Councillor Pearcy, please. Um, this is slightly unusual, but it's actually a question to uh, to us, to you, Chair. Um, looking at the uh, appendix to well, the audit committee responsibilities, uh, looking through the five areas there that we 
um, are responsible for as, a, as audit committee and audit committee members. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we should receive a report while we do that. Um, should receive a report from fraud leads on how resources been allocated. Possibly we got that. I don't know. I can't quite remember. Um, and then should be aware that the relevant portfolio holder is up to date and understand the activity being undertaken. I think the app portfolio is probably Andrew, but we want that clarified. Um, and then should support proactive counter activity, should challenge activity, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we've got a responsibility, maybe as part of your annual report that make a reference to it. Um, maybe that's probably the easiest thing to, to cover it off, just that we can, you know, follow our own, you know, do our bit to make sure we follow the right, you know, follow the strategy. That was the only part of my Chair. You've gone one ahead, so you're into the broad risk strategy, but I'm happy to cover both in the same same breath. But, um, uh, yeah, I can obviously answer to it, or we can wait and get to that report. Um, but part of the work we're doing with this fraud strategy is exactly that, to work through the checklist and say, what are we doing really well, what could we do better, and what are we definitely not doing, so that we can then have a program of work that says, let's tackle the things we're not doing, tackle the things that we don't do so well, so we can improve it. And that'll include the bits and pieces we can do with committees and members. Yes, please. Uh, if I just come on the portfolio hold a bit, because that, that wouldn't be me. I think that would probably be Nigel. Um, because um, I think as we're joining a partnership and we're adopting these shared policies, we're just we need to tweak the wording occasionally if we were a cabinet system with a portfolio lead it would be dead yeah so it's a it's a member lead but here it would be uh, the chair of audit standards committee the calm questions on this particular report i know we've jumped we jumped to the other one as well but we'll come back again and and start with the second one in a minute emma is that all right all part of the same picture it is all part of the same picture but i should be told off if i don't follow the script and the script says for this particular one you are um to resolve to approve and adopt the policy attached to the report yeah and authorise the strategic director of resources, so you do come into this, to approve future minor amendments to the policy in consultation with counter fraud and enforcement unit and one legal. I want a proposer now, please. Councillor Hurst, thank you. And a seconder? Martin Piercy, thank you very much. Debate. Pardon? <laughs> I think it's a sad indictment that we live in an age where this sort of thing is so necessary. And Emma, I wasn't in any way having a, a go against the system or anything like that. Um, we, I, I don't know, like everybody else in this room, I get two or three scam phone calls a week without any shadow of doubt. Me too. And um, yes, uh, where money is involved, people will try and uh, evade, uh, avoid payment. Clearly, if they can get away with it. Thank you, thank you, Nick. Um, so I take it there's no no debate, so we go straight to a vote. All in favour of the committee's re resolution to approve and adopt. Everybody, thank you. Nemcon. I hesitate to jump to the next one because the answers to some of the questions were on the page 187, paragraph 13 as to what the sort of damage is. So do you want to start with that, Emma? Uh, counter fraud and enforcement unit. Oh, are we doing the are we doing the strategy? Yes. I'm getting very confused. Have I jumped say, one? I've been up a while. <laughs> have I jumped one? <laughs> have I? I do apologise. Everybody's trying to outfox me. Um, I yeah. have got... It's like an investigation all over again. No, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Page 87, mind your mum. That is the one I'm referring to. It does state quite clearly 1.3. That is exactly what I was talking about. So that has caused absolute confusion for no good reason. That is the next item, agenda item 10, the counter fraud enforcement unit strategy. All right, are we all on the same page now? Good. Then would you mind starting with 1.3? 
and within local government, the quotation for the cost. Thank you, Emma. It's hideous. I think that's my it, quote for the cost. It's, it's large. Um, yes, it is the most common crime in the UK now, and it, in, it's fraud is within absolutely everything that we think of, do, um, etc. I probably have a different perspective because all I actually deal with is people that break the rules and and are trying to get, extort money. So it's a different perspective. I, I rely on stuff like this, clearly. Um, but what we wanted to do is have an overarching strategy that explained what it is, why people commit fraud, so that staff members, councillors, etc., could reference it and just get some background information because the hope is that off the back, well, not the hope, the plan is, this is a starter for 10. We then do the checklists with a bit of a... What do we do well? What are we not? What else can we do? And we build that in. And then we start to deliver the service area specific fraud risk registers. So again, we then work with the individual teams to make it relatable to them because this is such a broad topic now and it's very, very difficult to explain it to individuals. But if we make it so that we can have a revenues fraud risk register, we can talk to the revenues officer about the things they can do to prevent discount fraud, exemption fraud, um, business rates evasion, etc., and how we're mitigating that risk. And we can then talk differently to the procurement team about how we um, navigate bid rigging, for example, because the two are so hugely different and not each of the officers need to know about the others, the other's risks. So that's the plan is this is the start of 10. Again, this is the partnership um, strategy. So I'm bringing it here as it is with the other five councils. And then we'll, we'll do a report on what specifically we're doing great in each council, what we want to work on, and then we'll start to build in the, the fraud risk registers. Um, and clearly, I don't think they'll be published. I think they'll be um, confidential because of the nature of what they are. But hopefully it brings about more assurance because we're working with those officers so they understand fraud risk in their specific areas. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, the point I was trying to draw out, I'll read. Within local government, fraud is estimated to be in the region of £2.1 billion a year. It is worth paying attention to. And as uh, Emma already told you, uh, subletting is one of the biggest problems um, with this uh, going on now then. Questions, please. Councillor Davis, please. It's, it's a perennial question I always ask about staff training. Clearly, staff have a huge role in um, detecting this, but also are potentially um, um, susceptible to being tempted by fraud. How much of, um, time and effort do we put into training the staff in this strategy? So we've got different training streams. Um, and again, I'm all about making it as relatable as possible because I... I don't understand anything unless somebody makes me understand it in the terms of what I'm trying to do or what action I'm taking. So we're going to look at general fraud awareness um, and do that off the back of us become, you becoming a, a partner. Um, we've done the introduction to the staff generally, but um, we'll build on that and look at what the um, general provision is every couple of years as a refresher. Whistleblowing is key in that as well because we want people to recognise when they've got concerns about s colleagues that may not be doing something correct. So we want whistleblowing to be um, very much part of people's thinking too. And then the strategy, um, rather than bludgeoning everybody with, you know, read 20 pages, I think the risk registers will be more helpful because, again, they'll understand the specific risks in their specific area in the work they're doing. Um, so I think it will be an ever ongoing programme. It's on the service delivery plans. Training is its own is its own delivery. And each bit of work we have has its own training plan attached to it. Um, so I, I'm keen that we make people understand it and just get as much interaction as possible for lots of different reasons, as you say. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going back to the strategy, so um, rewind a bit. Just on the uh, prevention, I mean, there's a lot of uh, information here about uh, you know training the people within the uh, you know, offices uh, around identifying fraud. 
one of the other ones we can do is deter the actual um, people committing the fraud by publicising um, you know, successful outcomes for uh, for cases. That's not specifically in the strategy. So I just want to get a reassurance that is something that obviously you have to anonymise it. Um, but that is something that we would routinely do for all you know for, for cases that we've uh, proven. Yep. So we have a standard press release for any of our prosecution work um, that goes to the varying comms teams and the service lead for that particular area so it isn't just about the, the fraud work we do that will be about general enforcement for exactly that purpose for deterrent activity um and you know the same with this it's i'm keen to make as much information out there in the public domain about the activities and this, to put people off thank you councillor hurst please um, helpful. Um, could I understand, there must be a sanctions element attached to this at the, the, you know, the, at the end of the process. Is that delivered by the courts or are there controls which we can run using our own resources? For instance, if it relates to a council house, do we evict the tenant? I mean, what are the, what are the opportunities? if that's the right word, that come in out on the back of this. So again, that's going to be completely dependent upon what area you're looking at um, and what the legislation says. So the council tax, housing benefit and council tax support penalty and prosecution policy, which I think came here relatively recently, is obviously about our activities and the sanctions that relate to those activities for revenues and benefits. Tenancy fraud, as you say, and housing fraud is going to have an, an awful lot that will be attached to just getting the property back because we're dealing with vulnerable people. It might not be appropriate to prosecute. It might be that we just want to go down the civil route. That doesn't stop us necessarily looking for unlawful profit orders. Even if we're only getting the property back, we can still try and get some money back if they've been subletting. Um, fraud. You can prosecute anybody for fraud where there's a false statement or an omission, um, and that can be related to anything, any of the activity we do. So, for example, as I said to you earlier, we have fraud charges attached to a lot of our animal um, welfare unlicensed breeding cases because the advert is fraudulent because it's advertising something that is untrue. Um, we prosecuted somebody for uh, claiming one of those um, test and trace grants falsely. Um, and that was a fraud prosecution for another council. So it's very much dependent upon individual cases and it's about public interest test and evidential test. In every single case, we've got to look at them all in their own, at their, on their own merits. Further questions? No. Um, under this item, we are... In Asked to con resolve to consider oh, I'm struggling a bit with that, but um, okay. Uh, the counter fraud and investment unit fraud risk strategy and associated streams. Proposal, please. Thank you, Councillor Baker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well actually I was rather under the impression that before you got here, you should have considered it. But, um, uh, however, however all right. and the seconder. Yes, yes ma'am. I know you're not a fan of the the, um, the word note, but I wonder if actually the, the more appropriate term should be to, to note the counterfeit and the risk strategy and work streams rather than to. Resolve to consider them. I think considering them is what you've just been doing. Well, I was rather that impression, but I didn't write the script, so yeah, okay. So, um, oh, are you happy to note, or would you sooner accept, which is the way I go about it? Right. Well, we change that to to. Uh, we we're going to make a huge decision to note this report. Change that to consider. But oh, talking about notes. <laughs> Well, it seems to me that in either case, either the, either the committee accepts a report or it doesn't. If it if it notes it, it's accepted it. If it doesn't note it, it hasn't. 
Same difference. All right, note it is then. Uh, okay. We've still got the same proposer and second as a result of the change of wording, have we? Yeah. Oh, all right, thank you very much. Seconder. We did get to a seconder, I think. I thought I had Nick down for that, but I could be wrong. Martin, I apologise. Right, okay. Martin can be a seconder. Right. Right. Now. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it's about time somebody did, is the answer to that, isn't it? Um, right, okay. Well, as Nick pointed out earlier, you can hardly have a vote on a, a note. And you can hardly debate it since you've noted it. Do you wish to go further in the discussion with this? Thank you very much. We will eventually get there. I tell you, it's not always this jocket. I have to assure our friend from Bishop Fleming that sometimes this committee gets serious. Right, okay. Um, now then, it's you again, Emma, on um, 11. And, oh, right, well, before we go any further, it says resolve to consider again. What do you want me to do this time? No. Thank you. Very well. Item, agenda item 11, and it's Emma again, please count of fraud and enforcement unit report, which has got a few more pieces in it of interest. Please, Emma. Thank you, Chair. Last one from me, promise. Um, so most of the information about the um, activities of the unit I covered in the January report to try and limit delivery in the April um, meeting, but ordinarily I do the two committees to detail previous year's delivery and then what we're what we're looking at. So there isn't too much additional information in this one regarding what we've been undertaking because, as I say, I reported the majority of it in, in January. Um, where we have had some um, slight movement at 2.3 where I talk about the Gloucestershire math group. So that's the group with um, Gloucestershire Constabulary, Trading Standards, NHS Fraud, all the councils um, working together um, to... Uh, raise awareness for residents, workers, visitors to Gloucestershire. We have been awarded £5,000 by the OPCC towards building the web page, so supporting that, um, which is excellent news, so we're going to crack on with that. Um, and that will be for everybody to put information on, so there'll be lots of information about fraud risk, how people report different types of fraud, where, etc, etc. And then programs of work that each of those individual bodies are running, so what activities, what help people can get, etc. Um, victim support are also part of the group, so it's very much not just about the enforcement side, it's about supporting victims of fraud too. Um, in terms of delivery, um, the work plan's been um, put together, so I'm just finishing that off, so that widens the scope of some of the work that we'll be doing, so that'll be reported to you um, when I next um, next deliver a report, which I think is September um, time. Um, in terms of the second part of the report from 2.11 onwards, that's your annual update on RIPA and IPA, which is surveillance activity, how we get communications data, etc. So it's a run through of the policies and when they were last presented to you, the fact that they have been reviewed because we were subject to an inspection um, by the um, the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office, um, detailing who your senior responsible officers and authorising officers are, and then any updates that are going on regarding that, how many um, actions we've taken. We're about to roll out some refresher training regarding this. Um, and general enforcement training to all the teams that it would be a, um, applicable to, just as a reminder on what sort of activities um, we should be recording, considering this, etc. Um, hopefully, that generally covered it. Um, and Stroud, we had a good um, prosecution yesterday in court, um, guilty plea for um, animal welfare offences. Um, so that went through... Um, yesterday sentenced etc so again i'll make sure i include the full details of that in the next report happy to take any questions do you have any questions councillor davis 
It, it was touched on earlier, but the um, value of publicising when we have successful prosecutions, you know, the animal welfare one will attract some attention, presumably, and hopefully. Do we regularly do that? Yes, every case. Um, 2.4, page 112, first bullet point. Doesn't that answer a question put earlier as to the value of recovery? Mind you, the year reported on is 21-22, but it gives some idea of recovery. Yeah, and that's so that's just about um, single-person discount um, anomalies mm -hmm. um, regarding the data, as you say, that was uploaded for 21-22. Um, we're about to start working through the, the next two sets. So absolutely, that shows the, the the money that can be recovered. I mean, granted, a lot of that goes back to county. You don't get to keep it, but... Um, oh, that's a bit of a poor show. Right, OK. <laughs> it is. Uh, was that just... Was that for the whole group of councils, or just this... That was this one? We do do that piece of work for all six councils, so um, it's a rolling, rolling review. Actually, a different question, but uh, Cotswold is not mentioned here. Are they not part of the group you work with? In terms of how are they not mentioned, they, they are part of the partnership, absolutely. So all the Gloucestershire authorities except City. No further questions? In which case... Come on, All right. The committee resolves to note and comment on the report. And I'm supposed to have a proposer. Who wants to be proposer this time? Ah, uh, Martin, I'll let you go first, and Stephen can go second. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you going to object now, Stephen? There it is. And since we're noting it, I take it voting is not necessary. Right, thank you. Oh, yes, I'm reminded that we've actually nearly done... Well, that clock's all over the place, isn't it? Um, anybody got any idea what the time is? Oh, would, would you like a break, I've been asked. You have got an exempt item to deal with later, so if you want to. No? Right, everybody's happy. Now we get to some really serious stuff, as if the bot went before it wasn't. But there's no light-heartedness about this lot, is there, Graham? It is the third quarter Treasury report, so um, Treasury management. So, Graham Bailey, please. Thank you, Chair. So, third quarter Treasury management activity report for the financial year 23-24. The... Um, Treasury management strategy and investment strategy was set in February uh, 2023, and this is the uh, part of the monitoring of that, the outcome of that uh, strategy, and uh, shows the position as at the 31st of December. Um, if you look at the table at the foot of page 118, um, you get the summary there of the investment interest earned over that period from April 23 to 31st of December 23. So the internally managed um, investments, 1.7 million of interest on an average in investment of 48 million, which is a return of 4.908%. Uh, the fund investments over that same period, um, interest earned of 242,000, uh, a rate of return of 3.22. So overall, um, on an average investment of 58 million, a return of 4.6%, um, 2.03 2 million. Um, we move to table two. This sets out the fund performance. Um, so it gives you the 
the values of the uh, inve the fund investments as at the 31st of December uh, 23. So um, the property funds stood at a valuation of 4.89 million, and the multi-asset funds 3.815 million. Um, I draw your attention to paragraph 10. Um, we, we previously reported that the um, Lothbury Property Fund will be terminating. And um, we can report that this will happen on or by the 30th of June 2024. So um, this means that any loss in investment value will be realised in the 2024-25 financial year. Um, we have an investment risk earmarked reserve um, to help alleviate uh, the revenue impact of those losses. So um, the proposal is from Lothbury that either that we have the option either to return the return of our investment or to um, accept their proposal to merge into another property fund. So and we have to decide by the end of this month um, how we how we wish to proceed on that one. Um, in terms of detailed investments, if you look at table three on page 120, um, you can see uh, that's a snapshot at the end of December of of how the the uh, council's investments were deployed. Um, you can see a number of um, investments with other local authorities, 12 million, and um, other banks, 28 million, and um, 4 million in money market funds, 4.5 million with the Lloyds Group, and giving a total of that kind of investment on that day of 51.8 million. And um, so those are the the invest, invested sums in the uh, fund investments of 10 million and uh, we had borrowing of 100, 100 million point seven one seven and that's not changed during the year um, there's no repayments during this financial year if you look on page one two one we've got some statistical um, information about the how the performance of specified investments have, have improved um, since interest rates uh, rose um, to um, high levels since uh, following a, a very low um, period from uh, following the uh, 2008 when it was uh, almost like 0.1% for, for many years. Um, you can see that in quarter three, it's reached a, um, a return of 5.26, on uh, which uh, compares with 0.18 in uh, the first quarter of 21-22. So a dra dramatic change there. Um, the table below, table five, gives the performance of the multi-assets funds. These are more steady investments and... Um, so the returns have uh, reached 3.4 in quarter three, um, but in a comparable period in quarter one, 21, 22, they were 2.72. So much more stable. And similarly, with uh, on the next page, the property funds, you do that comparison, a return of 3.1 in quarter three uh, against 3% in quarter one, 21, 22. Um, so that's a... A summary of of where we are as at the third quarter um, of 22, uh, 23, 24. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Hurst, and then Councillor Piercy. Sorry. Thank Thank you. Can I can I unpick the Lothbury numbers a little bit, please, Graham? Um, the initial investment of four million was that actually cash, or was that a valuation at a point when 
money was put into the fund because obviously a loss of the thick end of a million pounds. I know the, I know the commercial property market has been awkward and I realise that commercial values have been downgraded by, uh, by assessors. How, how far have, has that been, how long have we been aware of this problem? Has it been a drift for over some time or is this a, a sudden realisation in quarter three? Where is the um, uh, where, are, where is the value in those figures coming from? Because I notice in Hermes as well, you've got uh, you've got a two hundred thousand pound loss there as well, which may well reflect market conditions rather than anything else. There's a second question. I'll let Graham go with that one first for me. The, the four million was cash purchase of the um, shares in the property fund. So we, we invested four million, and it has a a value of 3.089 million at the 31st of December. And that's not, uh, that was over, uh, that fall in value was um, over a period of time. It wasn't uh, a rapid fall it, at that particular point in time. It was a rapid fall earlier, um, around about October time, I think. So. That's the monitoring, um, section 151 to come in. Yeah, thank you. Just to build on that, and so Nick Graham referred to it in his intro. Table six in the report gives you the timeline of what happens with with the property funds, um, and we have reported to it, it to committee, you know, consistently over the last eighteen months. But if you if you look at the capital column, it's that quarter two, but particularly quarter three, twenty two, twenty three, where we saw it. And it's quite handy there that we have the return, including capital column. And you can see on the right-hand side the benchmark as well. So what, what, what I always think is quite interesting is that we saw um, quite a big loss in that quarter three through through lottery, where, where the benchmark didn't. Then the benchmark almost catches up the next the next month. So, the, the, so the next quarter, so then we had a sort of 2% bounce and the benchmark dropped by 14%. So it was that time about 18 months ago as Graham said, it was around the October time then, um, and it has been something which we reported to committee each time since. But I think that that table six and table five for the multi-asset funds is the really interesting one to see when the different changes have happened. Sorry, Graham. You mentioned that there was a decision to be made in June when Lothbury liquidate or get merged. Um, is that a decision that comes to this council or is that a decision that you make as an, as an investment manager? And and what is the implication of that? Are we, are we looking at the potential recovery of the loss by looking at the merger rather than the liquidation? I'll take that one, Nick, on the bet. I mean, Graham knows this better than I, than I could, but I'll take it on the basis that actually the decision would be mine as um, Treasury Management is delegated to the, to the 151 officer. So we have, a, we have two choices, as Graham sets out. There's a proposal to merge the, the properties, effectively, into a wider property fund. Do we want to do that for our share, or do we just want our money back, whatever it should be at that that time uh, and I've got to make that call by the end of the month now we've not finalized our thinking on that but I, I am minded that the best thing for us is to um, you know get the return of our money such as it is as Graham has said the investment risk reserve will offset the loss because we've we haven't cashed out on all the, the gains that we've had over the last few years because of our concerns about investing my inclination is to take the return of that money and must take a breather, work out in the current investment climate, what is the right place to invest? Is it another fund or is it something else? And then, um, you know, to, we'll probably take members on the journey in some way post-election as we did with these investments. So at the, at the moment, I'm not minded to kind of rush into transferring elsewhere, but to take our return and think about in the current position, because as we've seen, the returns that... Graham and, and Maxine and the team are getting at the moment are, you know, really stellar. So actually think about what's the best place to invest it. But it, it, it won't come back to council for decision, no, because it's, it's part of the process through which Treasury Management is delegated to me and the team. I hope that answers your question. 
Right. Further questions? Martin, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Graham, and uh, Maxine. I think was the report, the author of the report. Um, I've got just a couple of questions. Um, one is we've got 12 million with local authorities. How safe is the money with local authorities? You know, we heard that a number of authorities have, uh, are in financial difficulty. You know, how often do we re-review how secure that money is? You know, is it secure as perhaps we thought it might have been a few years ago? Um, and the, the second question is sort of goes on a little bit from uh, the discussion that was raised by um, Councillor Hurst and um, to the Section 151 officer is that looking at the tables, um, table four, five, and six, are clear that you know normal investments had a poor return, so we diversified, you know, diversified into multi-asset funds and property funds. Recent performance, well. You know the, the main fund is, is the proven ones and, and those two that you moved into aren't performing well so you, you mentioned that you know you might be thinking about where to put it so on a wider context is there going to be a wider review as to whether actually um as interest rates look as though they may well be staying fairly high or certainly higher than they were uh two or three years ago um is there a re-review of where we're going to put our money so two questions there thank you so um regarding investments with other local authorities we we um do review who who we put our money with to sort of take note of uh, what their their financial position is um and the there are sort of limits that are set out in the strategy about how much and for how long we can invest with other local authorities so um uh you know there there are some offers that come up that we we you know don't accept the high interest rates but they're with uh, local authorities that are sort of perhaps not as um, secure as others so um in, t in terms of the what was your second question about the reviewing the strategy yeah so it was a wider yeah. question on sort of um Andrew's earlier point about what you're going to do with the lottery fund as to whether, with the current climate, whether we should be thinking or whether the council is thinking about moving out of multi assets and property funds back into sort of normal normal investments because the interest rate profile is sort of reversed on those. I think uh, well we are, we're, we've got the opportunity to come out of Lothbury at the, at the moment. And I think Andrew. <laughs> intimated there that he's considering moving into other asset classes um in terms of the the other investments i think we're, that we've taken out as long-term investments and uh, there is a cost to to uh, liquidating them and uh, i don't think we would be talking about um liquidating the uh, lothbury investment if it hadn't been forced upon us so we, when we took it out, took the investments out, they were for the longer term, and um, uh, for that reason, I would, I would personally wouldn't foresee moving out of the fund investments. But again, that, that's Andrew's call, and when uh, the, the strategy is reviewed each year, uh, that decision will be taken anew. Yeah. Again, I'll come in as well as, as Graham says it, it comes into my remit. A couple of points there, Martin. Your, your first question about local authorities is a really interesting one. And we do we do review, and there have been a couple of local authorities over the last couple of years that we have looked at and said, you know, they're quite high profile, um, you know, in terms of their financial um, problems. So we probably wouldn't look at these things. But Alex actually said earlier that she used the word sort of bankrupt informally because local authorities in a way don't go bankrupt, even the 114 notice. So we're not aware of any issues in, in any sort of inter-authority lending which caused a problem. But as Graham says, we do keep it under review. Um, in terms of the wider thing, yes, we will look at it in terms of the, um, the strategy. The interesting thing with property funds is that where we made the call as an authority that we were really interested in those property funds with very stable tenants, very high occupancy rates, which is absolutely the right thing for us to do. Um, of course, less risky investments pay lower returns. And in a, in a sort of 
in the world where investment is an interest rate shot at rapidly, they then become less attractive to investment to, to others. So that's that's where property is is really interesting. In terms of the multi-asset funds, you know, one quarter does not does not a trend make. But if you look at the last quarter, the combined as you know interest and capital was a nine percent return. If if we could guarantee nine percent on everything, we'd all be very happy. So I think that. But as Graham says, and you've rightly pointed out, property is probably the time now where we think, will we go again on a property fund? And if so, which one? Um, but yeah, that's not a decision I want to rush into. And as Graham's rightly said, we'll consider it as part of the next Treasury Management Strategy as well, where we are with it. Thank you. I mean, I think the main sort of reassurance I thought was that it's been reviewed yes. and constantly, and, and that's what you've given me, so thank you. Councillor Davis. Um, two quick questions, one quite detailed. Um, you mentioned the investment risk reserve offsetting some of the loss should we choose to take our money out of um, the uh, Lowbury account. How, how much money is in that and will it cover all of the loss or what, what's the percentage? So I think, and I'll look at Lucy, 800, 820, um, but we review it each year end because what we've used to fund it is that because of the rapidly rising interest rates and the fact we made these investments we have each year for the past three or four years had considerably more um, uh, investment income than we anticipate so it gives us a surplus at year end so rather than spend all of that or i think we've put it to one side because at the same time as we've seen these uh, returns go up we've seen the capital values fall so what we've done each year myself lucy gray when we do the accounts we match the two off effectively and that's what we'll do this year. Where we've had a surplus of investment income, we'll make sure that it matches any fluctuation in capital value to ensure there's no impact on the general fund. That was something which, for those with long memories, have been on the committee a long time when we first talked about these investments. We said that we wouldn't want to be in a situation where we were impacting on that general balance. So that's what we've done ever since that point. Th thank you for that. That's hugely reassuring and, and sort of sort of says that we are covering much of our potential loss in that as we should be in and as we're working on it. Um, my next question is, I, I remember um, huge debates when we made the decision to step out of the safest investments into slightly more risky investments. And, um, and, and obviously a good thing to do, and we've seen that in the rates of return. I'm not criticising that decision. My question is, um, understanding that you know, the landscape changes, and I was never comfortable that property was the right one to be in, but property doesn't look as good as it might have been. How much um, influence will a future audit and standards committee have on the direction of where we make that investment versus obviously the individual investment decisions, which would be horrendous if we made those? So, so I think the, I think the answer is that um, the framework and the strategy and the counterparty limits and the different asset class limits are all set by council on the recommendation of this committee. So, although the individual decisions are delegated to myself and the team, that uh, strategy we look at it uh, in the late January or early February meeting, wherever that timing falls, and then it goes on to council. So, absolutely. Future Audit and Standards Committee can recommend on to Council what it believes those limits should be. So again. Um, may I direct the question through you, Chair, to the 151 officer? Yeah. So in the Lothbury case then, Andrew, when you come to make that decision, and um, quite an onerous responsibility on a single person, I understand, to effectively write off the thick end or the opportunity of a million quid, what information do you have at your fingertips available to you to make that decision in terms of what's going to happen to the Lothbury assets, uh, whether the Lothbury assets are going to be realized by being sold off or whether they're going to be um reassessed before they get parked somewhere else in, in terms of their the current value what 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 is the level of information that you have 
available to you in order to make a, a value judgment on that? I, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's part of that question is really m my personal curiosity, really, as much as you know, res your responsibility to the council. Thanks, Nick. And that's a that's a fair question. So, first off, I should clarify the the decision that's available to us now won't really change anything in relation to that Lothbury loss because the the options that are on the table are effectively do we want to take our share of the property fund um, into a new fund and then that will be our investment and that will be subject to all the usual ups and downs and returns yeah exactly or do we want to say effectively no we're not going to be part of the transfer so we would like our cash realized through um, any remaining asset sale and there would be um, you know, quite a complicated process that we wouldn't see all the details of, of working out which assets go into the new fund and which, which are sold off effectively. And that would be worked out between the two funds. Between those two calls, our loss will still be realised effectively because in, in accounting terms, you know, it's still a new investment. So, so the reason we've been happy to stay in these funds is that you know, all of us, members and officers regard these funds as long term there was that short term loss we hope to come back but it's the closure of Lothbury which turns that into a, a realized asset so I'm, I'm not making a call which could reverse that loss in any way in a way what we're doing is is like we would do with any investment return you know if, if one of those local local authority um, investments uh, came back um, it, it would, it's a decision, myself, Graham, Max, Lucy, where does, where, does the, where does the money go? That's effectively the same thing. It's just there's a different option on the table this time, this new, this new property fund. So it, it's, not, it's not me choosing to write off that, that million. I, would, I wish I could make a different call there. Um, it's actually what do we do with the money when it comes back to us? Should we decide that, that option? It's, it's a new investment decision, if you like. But in terms of the loss, that's probably done. Uh, we, will, we will, I'm sure, it, I hope it goes without saying for everyone, it will be, you know, recorded within the accounts. I'm sure there'll be lots of discussions with Alex and Mark about the, the correct way of doing that. And then it's a new investment going forward, whatever we should choose to do. And obviously, you know, it, 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 you know for many of you, or some of you, you won't be here, but it will come back to, the, to a future committee on what we have done as well. I hope that helps then. Any further comment, questions? No? Well, in this particular case, the committee resolves to accept. Pardon? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I resolve. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> actually, well, I'm I'm at a, I'm at a disadvantage. I'm reading what's in front of me, which does say resolves. Actually, so I I didn't see that one. I apologise. Anyway, resolve or resolves to accept the Treasury Management Activity Third Quarter Report for 23-24. Do I have a proposal, please? Councillor Baker and seconded by Councillor Bissi. Thank you. Right, now then, do you wish to debate? Any comment at all? Yes, it's Councillor Davis. I, I think there's been some probing questions on, on the loss, and quite rightly that we've done that. But I did just want to put on record that I don't think we're making that as a criticism of any individual or the decision that was made to um, diversify into slightly riskier options mm -hmm. in the hope of a higher return, because that has been successful in most cases. So I think it's important this committee doesn't leave it on a note of, of criticism. <laughs> Thank you, I would agree. I was about to comment that in any case, longer term observers of the market will realise it does go down and up. And if you're restricted in when you can act, you sometimes get caught. Um, not always. Some manage to ride the wave all the time. But this time we weren't so lucky. Thank you for that. Yes, my tribute to the accounts department and to the investment department, and I get personal satisfaction from not having to read out 0.65 return on interest, which I was doing for years, and it was annoying me intensely because inflation was 2.5.
Right, well, in that case, uh, I need a vote. Now. Patience is a, I'm sorry, is a virtue which seems to be shared by internal auditors. It dutifully sits there for two hours at a time before it gets a chance to speak, and I think it's awfully good of you. Um, so I'm sorry we've taken that bit of a long time to get to you, but it's now your turn. So uh, draft 24, 25 internal audit plan. Pierce, I think it's you, please. Thank you, and uh, good evening, Chair, to you and to the committee. So thank you. So on page 129 of your agenda pack, you have the draft internal audit plan uh, for 2024-25, and this has been developed uh, following a, a very thorough risk assessment undertaken by uh, staff in conjunction uh, with management. And the plan takes into account, Chair, the Council's priorities, its objectives, its risks, and its risk appetite uh, levels as well as set uh, by management and uh, as well as internal audits own judgments of the Council's risks. So the plan as ever is in, in, in indicative quarters um, uh, with an outline scope uh, for each audit which will be firmed up chair nearer the time in conjunction uh, with discussions with um, management uh, um, and it, the plan also shows where relevant how uh, that specific audit relates to the council's uh, risk register. As ever, Chair, the plan is is flexible. It's it's um, put together at a point in time, but as we know, over, during the course of the year, um, risks are liable to change, and so the plan can also change to reflect uh, uh, that uh, throughout the year. Um, and also, Chair, as the committee is, is uh, aware, uh, I do invite uh, all members, not, uh, as well as this committee, but all members uh, to uh, uh, consult with either myself or Steph uh, at any time if they feel that there is a, a particular area of the council services that uh, would benefit uh, from our attention. Um, just with your permission, Chair, can I also say... Uh, I. I this year, you know, uh, uh, the, the plan really leapt out to me. I mean, it just shows the level of work and the detailed analysis uh, that Steph has undertaken and brought to the planning uh, process, uh, uh, which, which is uh, really good to see. Uh, but uh, happy to take any questions. Questions? I'm looking around for any questions on this particular item. No? Everybody happy? What they read? No, no challenges, Stephen. None at all. You've written no comment. Well, you've scored a first, Pierce. Well done. I'm sorry you had to sit there that long to find out. No? Um, right. Um. Actually, to be perfectly fair, I don't think I've written down anything that was outstanding there. Just um, I think we're probably looking for some bit more information on Brimson Port relatively soon, but that was the only one that, that uh, uh, did cross my mind that perhaps we might want to... Um, bring that up it is scheduled for quarter three i see item 26 so um if we're not chased before then then um we'll wait patiently for 23 but i think most people are quite keen to know what's going to happen there right what um, Well, unfortunately, it says, and it does say resolve this time, does it? Yes. Okay. The committee resolves to note the draft internal audit plan and 2425 reflects the current risk profile. 
of the Council and agree the draft internal audit plan 2425 is detailed as Appendix A. Um, proposer then, please. Councillor Davis, thank you. And the seconder. Martin, thank you very much. Do you wish to debate? Paula, Councillor Baker, please. <laughs> That's fine. Um, my only comment is it's hugely ambitious and um, best of luck. It does seem like an awful lot of work. Yes, please, Chair. Just to say that there's quite a mixed bag in there. So we've got some audits that are going to have more days, so in-depth pieces of work like Gloucestershire Building Control Partnership Review or the review of the New Housing Act and, and how that filters through. But then you've also got some quick wins in there with a few grant certifications. So we've balanced it out in line with the target audit days for the year. But as the committee expects, the plan will shift as the year progresses. If audits do take longer, based on the you know the, the, the agreed scope when we get there, the risk, we will come to committee with any proposed plan changes for, for review and agreement. Thank you for that. Any further comment? In which case, thank you very much, both of you. And for your services for the year to date. We would like that, though. Um... We now move to agenda item 14, update on the... Right. Sorry, you've got some... I think we still didn't vote. Yeah. Pardon? We didn't vote. You didn't vote? Well, I'm not surprised because we actually just don't resolve to note it. So are we going to vote to note? Pardon? We've got an agreement. Oh, right, okay. So you want to vote. All right, go on and vote. Just for the record, we'll have a vote. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm so. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I read your minds and don't bother, but they're mine. Okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Always get there in the end. There's always about 25 people telling me how to do it, so we should be arriving at the right place eventually. Now then, are you satisfied that we've had the vote? NIMCON, you've got that down, haven't you? Right, so now it is the update on the annual government's uh, statement. All oh, right, action plan. And this was promised at the last meeting, and it's now Claire Hughes, monitoring officer, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is the um, latest update on the action plan that was came as a result from last year's annual governance statement. So this is the last update you'll get against this current action plan. Um, all of, Most of the actions within the um, action plan have been completed. Um, that is with the exception of, of two items. One is around the leisure transition, which obviously needs to run over two um, governance statement um, periods because of the fact that the project is ongoing into the next year. So that will appear again in the next annual governance statement um, when that comes forward to you in your July meeting. And the other area which hasn't unfortunately made as much progress as we would have liked is around our approach to how we manage projects and programmes. Um, so. We do have already some existing processes and procedures, but we wanted to do a piece of work around establishing a toolkit um, and moving the tracking of projects and programmes onto IdeaGen. So some testing has started in that area in terms of using IdeaGen, and we have got a draft toolkit. Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the resource that we'd allocated to do this piece of work has been sort of pulled away to do a lot more work on the election than perhaps we anticipated. So... Um, this is going to have to be pushed into the to the next programme. So again, that will appear again on um, the annual governance statement that comes forward to you in July for a piece of work to be concluded later in the year. But otherwise, um, all the actions that were previously identified as needing to, to be done have been done. Um, so I think um, in my experience, it's not unusual that you have a couple of things carried over. Not ideal, but um, I think we've made really good progress in terms of... Um, our governance as a council in the last year so um i'm not overly concerned about the the one action that's been delayed i'm happy to take questions then well, i think i'm right in saying that sign off now is september 
instead of July for accounts and things, and governance normally goes with that. So how far away are we going to be by September? Um, so we'll bring the um, um, this so the look back over this year's annual governance statement. I've already started drafting, so I can hand that over um, to the, to whoever takes over from me. So I'm intending to bring that as a draft, bring that in July for um, audit committee, and there'll be an action plan for the next year attached to that for you to approve. Thank you. Questions? I'll take Martin first and Stephen second. Thank you, Martin first, please. Um, I, I take the point, and I think that you know it's uh, very, it's good progress against all of them together. Um, I think my point is that particular one, project and program management. I'm a little disappointed on it. it's not completed because it is very important for all the council with all the projects and program of projects that we've got running on. There may be, I guess, what my question is: there's there's three items here. But have we made any general progress about projects and programs that might not be specifically highlighted here that will give me some sense that we are better than we were sort of 12 months ago in terms of managing projects and programs? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we've, as I said, we've already developed a kind of draft toolkit. So we're consulting and people are testing that already and people are starting to use, we're starting to use idea gen. Um, to track our projects so we can run those reports and that from there. So we've definitely made some really good progress. It's just that we haven't managed to finish the piece of work. So I guess perhaps a, a point to pick up for next time is that we could have maybe done a, a percentage and said we're, we've done probably, you know, we've probably done a quarter of the work that we need to do. It's just that we've not, not unfortunately, been able to finish it. Thank you. Well, Councillor Davis, please. I, I, Martin, actually, I think ask the question I was going to ask almost word for word. I, I, I just do remember used to having a cartoon of a guy firing a bow and arrow and a machine gun salesman behind him, and he turns around and goes, look, can't you see I'm busy fighting a war? I just wonder if it's a massively false economy to not have finished that work when there's so many other things going on. plan proposal. Mr. Piercy, thank you. And seconder. Councillor Baker, thank you very much. Do you wish to debate, even though we were asked to note? Do you want to debate anything? No debate. Well, you can vote to note if you want to, but I think you've already agreed to note it, haven't you? Oh, thank you. All right. We must get this sorted out. It's becoming a little bit of Hampton Court maze. Um, well, I don't think we need to do that. Um, now then, agenda item 15 is standing items, and the first one is the risk management um, register, corporate risk register, and that's uh, section 151. Officer Andrew Cummings, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so this is our standing item where I just present the risk register with um, just a bit of an update on what's changed. Um, as, as you'll be able to tell from the report, actually not much has changed because we reported on the quarter three updates at the last committee and there's only been some changes um, because the quarter four process of updating is going on. Um, albeit the ones that linked to our major financial corporate risks were updated. Um, I did that after the budget setting. So the um, risk SR1 is around inflation and that having a major impact on um, service delivery. I think that risk has reduced in probability. So we've reduced the scoring from nine to six. Um, inflation is reducing and we have sufficient sums within the MTFP in my view to deal with it. So I think the probability has um, decreased. Um, risk SR2, which is one around information governance, um, we've done a lot of work around the controls on that, as you heard earlier this evening. Um, Owen has reviewed the risk, but he thinks the overall scoring uh, is appropriate, and I pretty much agree. So we're still looking at a probability of two, but a severity of four, um, because the, the consequences of not meeting sort of these uh, 
sort of risks head on is, is quite significant. Um, the risk around the uh, failure to develop a uh, balanced budget um, remains the same, I think, but still um, I've reviewed that after the budget process there. Um, it, I did say in the report um, that uh, I would update any of the changes which have happened since I wrote the report. There haven't been any. Um, the only thing I will say is that we have a very low scoring corporate risk, which used to be a very high scoring risk around the um, local government pension scheme and our contributions. Uh, we'll be kicking off over the next few months the valuation process. Um, that scheme is better funded for us than it has ever been. It's well over 100% funded. The last few years have been very good for that position. So I think the risk that our contributions will be asked to increase above our budgeted level is still exceptionally small. So there's no formal update to the risk here, um, but that is, again, going to stay as a very, very minor risk, one that was previously quite significant. So I'm happy to take any questions, albeit there's not a lot of change since you last saw the risk register. Thank you, Andrew. Questions, Martin Brown, please. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. How's this risk register used? A oh, really good question. Um, so it's one of the things that we look at in our corporate governance group. So um, officers are encouraged through our risk management framework to um, identify the major risks to their service area. And if we think that they are sort of major ones to the council, they go on the strategic risk register. And that allows us to think about how we are adapting and responding to these things. So to take the information governance one, for example, um, Owen and the, the corporate governance group, we're looking at what risks we have and then actually what do we need to do about it? What things do we need to have? Those controls can either be um, preventative, trying to prevent the risk from happening or in, in mitigation, if should the risk occur, how do we reduce the impact? So it's really for us as officers to think about how we respond to risks in the environment. And then as a committee, I think it's really helpful. And one of the big changes we've made over the last two years that you can kind of get under the skin of this and work out what officers are doing. And is there anything that you as councillors should be doing about risks? And we've had, and the, examples now are going to fail to come to mind which is not going to help me but we've certainly had conversations in this room where councillors have suggested things which have gone on the strategic risk register or asked us to think about something else in a bit more detail so it's to bring the short answer is it brings all those conversations out into the open in a really focused way so davis please I'm not sure I understand what failure to fulfill requirements of the building safety regulator is, but it does sound quite serious that we haven't done it. <laughs> so that was a risk we put on uh, towards the end of last year. This was, um, I can't remember the name of the legislation, but with the new regulator of um, building control, all of our building control officers were required to reset professional exams and reach a level of certification to allow them to be able to make judgments on buildings. So um, essentially we were in the position where there was a hypothetical possibility that our staff could have gone for these exams, not reached the required accreditation, and that we wouldn't be able to have a building control service anymore. But it's still showing as a quite a big risk in yep. terms of... Um, severity and probability. So um, I, I need to ask Paul, uh, and, and I know he's doing it as part of course four, actually to update on that, because I think actually officers have got, I don't know all of their results, but we've got certainly enough to run a service, um, but it's taken quite a long time because obviously the regulator and whichever professional body it is has had every person in the country doing exams at, at the same time. So we'll get an update on that for the next committee. Councillor Piercy, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this might be in the optics, but um, just looking at strategic risk two, information governance. Now, we had presented earlier in the meeting a whole new policy on information governance. Now, when I look at this, I, you know, the risk score is eight, and our target is eight. So that suggests to me, well, we just do. We don't need to. We don't need to manage it anymore because we've got to the target. Spillers as usual, and yet we've got a new government governance policy. So we're doing more than we 
we're doing. So why are we doing that if we've already got to an eight? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's an excellent question. And I think it's because in terms of this one, I don't think the target risk in terms of the severity is ever likely to shift. It's all, always likely that to be there as a four. So the, the only way we can push the dial is if we reduce the probability to one, which is, I can't remember the exact wording we use, extremely unlikely, almost never likely to happen. I think our information governance pos policies would have to be extraordinarily robust to ever get in that that sort of sphere. But I'm sure if Aaron was still here, he would say, actually, we've got to run quite fast to stand still in some of these things. And I think that's where we are. So we don't want to find ourselves with policies which are out of date uh, or we're not responding to new threats. So we are putting a lot of work in to make sure that the risk stays at that level and doesn't increase. It's broadly where I think we are, Martin. Thank you. Yes, I mean, things like cybersecurity, you've got to run really, really fast to keep to that level of school. So information governance is a similar one like that. So, uh, yeah, I think I'll get that. Thank you. Any more? Well, you're accredited with alien absolutely nothing at all from this, not even noted according to the script. Yeah. Uh, I well, think we should um, tick it as being done. Actually. Yeah, it's it's a uh, you know standing item effectively that we bring it in front exactly. of you consideration. Uh, the only thing I would say is this fully populated now. Um, when I was hunting around the place, it didn't seem, it appear to have as much detail in, in it as Excelsis used to have occasionally. Uh, uh, it is fully populated. So I can take you through it. And okay. It. Fair question. Martin's point is well made, I think, that the, I noticed with interest that on Emma's uh, risk, they had a 5x5 five five grid instead of a 4x4 four four grid, so we can't even standardise that. Right, um, work programme next item. Um, effectively, this is just giving it the nod, because uh, effectively you're going to have a change of committee, so... Um, Work program is there on page 153. Anybody got any comment? Please, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll just make one point. Obviously, we've um, uh, heard from Bishop Fleming earlier about their plan. Mm -hmm. So we will um, make sure that we find the right committee dates for that. And obviously, as that can, as, as Alex said, that may flex depending on other circumstances. So we'll make sure that that's appropriately added into the, the work programme at the right times. Uh, um, thank you for that. Yes, I would rather expect that to happen. Um, OK. Now then, um, we have uh, agenda item 16. And this is an internal audit progress report update 23-24. And it does contain exempt item, not for publication, on page 160, what I presume to be 165, since it isn't actually numbered. So can we deal <coughs> with this one, please, up to page 164? Um, and I think this is Piyush again, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, you have the R of Progress report on page 155 of your agenda, and this shows progress against the internal audit plan for 2023-24, uh, uh, as well as the outcomes uh, against our plan. Uh, uh, so audit activity delivered, I think, up to to about mid-March, is that, that, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, Steph. Uh, it also contains um, an, an update on uh, counter-fraud activity. Uh, there is a summary table chair, uh, which I'm delighted to say um, the items where we have provided an assurance level are either substantial or acceptable, uh, uh, including, uh, as you mentioned, Chair, uh, an exempt item, uh, there are two follow-ups for which uh, a level of assurance is not uh, required. And in terms of the counter-fraud activity, 
uh, that uh, the counter fraud team have undertaken during the year. Uh, there was one irregularity that was referred to them and that was subsequently uh, closed and there are details of that case in the papers. And then on page 167, uh, Chair, you have uh, the actual plan and the progress against it. And happy to take any questions. Thank you for that. Questions? Working. Looking around. No questions, Pierce? If not, I have got one question for you on that particular script. And it is page 161, 2.3, or 2.233. Follow-up approach has been revised within 23-24 and internal actors will not allocate an assurance level. Why? Um, there is a bit of a moot point around this, Chair. And, um, so we undertake an audit and we look at, if, if you like, a whole range of items during, during that audit. The follow-up only concentrates on a small proportion of that full audit programme. And so... Um, what we feel is that the follow-up should not be used to make uh, uh, to provide an assurance level on the whole, if that makes sense. I'd be interested in committee views on on that. Anybody want to make a comment? Want any questions, Councillor Hurst? Depends entirely on the quality of the sample. Yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, I have been a, in my in my day job an auditor previously, not now, but um, it is a difficult one. Um, because I understand that the follow-up only deals with the points that were raised from the previous audit. It doesn't redo the whole audit. Um, and so I guess... But an audit committee, it's difficult to know well, how far. I guess we just have to do it by the number of actions that have been completed. You know, so we have to assume, I guess, if all the toy actions have been completed and all the medium actions have been completed, but the low ones haven't, that actually that probably, if it was a sort of a red, you know, it was a unacceptable, it's probably acceptable. But I guess that means that we have to do judgment and maybe we might have to ask those questions in committee as opposed to having a clear, def you know, clear assessment as we go, which is. You know, I don't know whether that's right or not. I'm sort of sort of debating it in my mind, I guess. Sorry, Steph. To round it off as well with our wider processes. So the paper in front of you is, is probably unique because it's one where you've got a previous follow-up approach with the assurance opinions there. And then you've got this one that was done at a slightly later point where we don't have an assurance opinion. ARA are currently in consultation for a new internal audit recommendation monitoring approach. So what you may have spotted in the audit plan as part of the earlier pack, um, there aren't any follow-up audits in there. And that's because as a standard approach for ARA, we will be reviewing all audit recommendations going forward. And that will be done through the idea gen system, through engagement with lead officers. And what Audit and Standards Committee will see is a report and a piece piece of work and updates within the internal audit progress report about what number of recommendations have been raised and what, how many of those recommendations remain open or outstanding. So in future reports, you won't see this nature of follow-up outcome. What you will see is the internal audit recommendation monitoring and the council's position against that as a overall summary, but also in, as de in detail per audit. Okay. Just to emphasise that point, uh, currently we only undertake formal follow-ups or we have under, uh, 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 for limited assurance audits, okay? So if something is, uh, an, uh, as you've got here, an acceptable or a substantial, we wouldn't normally follow up any recommendations within those. The new approach that Steph has mentioned means that for all audit reports, all outstanding recommendations, will we will um, uh, follow up to make sure that they have been implemented. So, um, uh, you know, you could have one report which has maybe one high high risk recommendation and, and, and say five mediums, and that's an acceptable. But that high risk item, we would never follow up and, 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 and see if that has actually been implemented with our new approach uh, that uh, that will be the case uh, so this uh, so the committee will actually have more information 
uh, on the implementation of our recommendations going forward. In the new approach, is that the action owner certifying that they have completed the action rather than all internal order independently checking they've done the action or are is there going to be some element of independent you know verification of that action completion sorry yeah yeah in, in, uh, they will have to provide evidence as well uh, to to get provide us with comfort that um you know they're not just saying yeah we've updated this policy we will need to see the evidence as well so am I to understand from what's been discussed that effectively any uh, review will now appear as idea, Jen? Will the audit committee in future, whoever it may be, actually get a note to say this has been now done or should they have found out for themselves on idea, Jen, is what I'm trying to get at. I think the idea, Chair, is that uh, the committee will see a report which shows what the outstanding recommendations are and whether they have been implemented or not. The normal service will be resumed. Well, I think that satisfies me. I don't know about everybody else. How do you feel, everybody? Mm -hmm. Any further questions on this part of the report? They're all quite happy. Now then, I think the procedure now is that I have to advise you that if you wish to discuss Appendix B, there has to be a vote to go into closed session. And you've got it up there. Pardon? Sorry, I think in terms... Yeah, I've got an instruction sheet in front of me, and I'm reading from that. Now, if we're getting a different answer up here, things aren't working as they should. No, I don't, I don't think you're getting a different answer. So I think... No. Effect so ah. effectively, that's if you wish to discuss that um that element of the report so, so you may not wish to discuss it i think that's right isn't it uh, is that yeah. what you're trying to start so all i'm saying to you is if you want to discuss it so now i'll ask you do you wish to discuss the exempt item which is on the page 165 of this report you can, you can still make the same resolution that's only if you want to discuss that particular item does anybody at all wish to make any comment on this exempt item? Councillor Baker, wait a minute. If you want to discuss it, we have to go into closed session. This is what I'm trying to establish now. Do you wish to discuss it? I'm not saying you can't. I know others want to get off, but part of the job is complete this thing, and it has to go through this procedure. We've had this game before. If you'd like to comment, we will go into, into session. So don't hold back. No, this is probably um, Nobody wishes to comment? My point was that maybe they should be taken separately if there was going to be any debate. That was the issue. They would be taken separately. They have to be taken the, separately. The point being that the papers are in the privileged domain, whereas the resolution is in the public domain. That I understand. So the vote on the, on the up to, why I said you'd only discuss up to page 164 is because that's in the public domain. 165 is not. All right. Now, am I to understand you do not wish to discuss page 164? Five, rather. Beg your pardon, I get that right. In which case, we will go over that and merely take a vote. I go back to this. So now you've got the committee resolves too up there. All right. So um, am I obliged to read this since you've got all this trouble now? Well, what about the people who are avidly watching this on the broadcast? Can they see it? They can see it. Fine, okay, right. Well, you know what you're doing. I want to propose it, please. Councillor Davis. And second? Councillor Piercy. Right, thank you. Right. Okay, now, do you want a debate? No, I thought perhaps you wouldn't. <laughs> You can speak on behalf of all. Very well. In which case, um, 
You've got a resolve, so you must vote. So can I have a show of hands, please? Thank you. Right. And that, I think, brings us to the end of the business and the end of the year. Before you all go home, I shall delay you just a 